Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Sai, and on behalf of the Shoreline PTA Council Board of Directors, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to each of you this evening. Thank you for joining us in this dedicated space to talk about the issues that are impacting the lives of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. I'd like to also extend a, a very special thanks to SUNY Tolton and the City of Shoreline for their co-sponsor <clears throat> co-sponsorship of and collaboration with tonight's event. I'm really excited about tonight's guest speaker, the PTA Council through the vision and the efforts of my friend and colleague, Missy Liu, had formed a new committee back in January, whose overarching goal is to reduce stigma surrounding mental health issues within our schools and community through education, support, and advocacy. So with this committee emerging, it has intersected so well with the fact that May is being recognized as Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month and also National Mental Health Awareness Month. <clears throat> so now Missy will share a few details of the committee's work, um, followed by the introduction of our guest speaker. So Missy. Thanks, Linda. Uh, my name is Missy Liu, and I am the co-chair of the Shoreline PTA Mental Health um, Committee that started in January, as Linda just mentioned. Um, just a little bit about our committee. Uh, we started um, in actually response to the mental health crisis um, that we've all noticed since COVID. Um, Linda kind of mentioned this, but um, we're here to break the mental health stigma um, in our Shoreline School District. We're doing that by educating advocating and supporting families and students, especially those from underrepresented communities, such as people of color, multilingual, foster families, homeless families, uh, families with disabilities, um, I, uh, 504 and IEP plans, and families um, who are experiencing homelessness, as well as those who identify as LGBTQIA+. You can learn more about our work that we just started at shorelinepta.org. Um, and I encourage you to join us on Facebook and Instagram too. There's a lot of great information that we're putting out to our community. And I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Today, I'm really grateful, just like Linda said, super grateful that we have our very first event um, co-sponsored with SUNY Tolton at the City of Shoreline and with our guest speaker, Ms. Lynette Pang from phase three consulting and counseling and consultation to provide our very first event. And as they both mentioned, it's Mental Health Awareness Month and Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So it's a perfect match. Um, thank you, Linda, for um, being the brainchild behind this event and pulling us all together. Um, before I introduce you to our wonderful speaker, I just wanna tell you about two things. Um, Following this event, you're gonna be able to continue the conversation that we're having here. And we're starting our first ever caregiver connections group. And that will be facilitated by two mental health committee members, um, Day Shogren and Tiffany Fujioka. They're gonna facilitate five meetings over the summer. And um, the first one's gonna be on Thursday, June 9th, next week from 6.30 to eight via Zoom and all are welcome. I'll put, again, there's information in our website about that. Um, but thanks, Day and Tiffany, if you're here, um, thank you very much for stepping up and leading our community through these important discussions. Also following the event, um, we'd really appreciate if you could help complete a survey um, that could tell us more about your interests. And this information will be kept confidential and help us um, plan for future events that we'll be doing next year. So, Without further ado, um, Ms. Lynette Pang received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Virginia Tech and Masters of Art from the University of Pacific in Psychology. As a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State since 2005, she has nearly 20 years of clinical experience in California and Washington. She works with adults of all ages, supporting clients with various mental health issues including depression, anxiety, life transitions, and relationship issues. Approaching her practice with a multicultural lens, Lynette considers her client's race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, 
religion and spiritual beliefs, and socioeconomic status. In therapy, she explores what it means for clients when intersections of these aspects affects one's identity and experiences. Ms. Pang is also a shoreline parent and a member of our community. Welcome, Lynette. Okay, well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I wanna say thank you so much for having me here, um, especially thank you to City of Shoreline and Shoreline PTA and mental health community. Um, this is a matter that's very, very near and dear to my heart, obviously professionally, but also personally, just because of the fact that I am a shoreline parent and I have kids in the shoreline school. So um, this is a very important topic and very relevant right now. And I'm happy to spend the evening with you guys uh, sharing more information. Okay, so there's a lot of information here and I'm gonna do my best to try to present it in a way that's um, brief, concise and uh, informative. Um, and certainly if there's anybody that has questions, feel free to reach out, um, put a question in the chat box. Um, if we don't have enough time today, I'm more than willing to answer questions or um, just provide more information and support, okay? I do wanna make sure that people understand that I'm not able to provide any kind of clinical information or excuse me, clinical advice or actual uh, support to anybody that actually has um, an issue that they're dealing with just because I'm not uh, um, in a relationship with anybody therapeutically here. This is just informational um, information for information purposes and um, just to help uh, educate. Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started here. So um, I went ahead and titled tonight's um, uh, presentation as AANHPI uh, Mental Health. It's real, it matters, and there's help. Okay, so I want to recognize that um, all of that is, is just very relevant right now. Okay, so I'm going to move along here. Oops. Oops. Okay, I'm trying to move my presentation along and, uh, and see what's going on here. Are you? Hey, okay, Lynette, are you clicking the arrow for your next slide? Yeah, I'm doing the page up, page down. So I'm trying to see what's going on here. Do I need to do anything else here? You maybe try to unshare and share again. <laughs> okay, I can try that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's try that again then. Sorry about that. Oh, goodness, just what we need here. <laughs> okay. Can we see that? Yes. And then if you put it into the slide show mode, that button, yep. To, a little bit to your right, the little screen next to the minus. Okay. Oh. There we go. Okay, here we go. So we're going to start with a brief historical um, context of the Asian diaspora in the U.S. Um, this is just a little bit of information just to kind of highlight um, how Asians uh, ended up here in the US. Um, so Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders represent people from at least 40 different Asian ethnic groups. We speak 40 plus languages and represent 20 plus different countries. So we're a very wide and vast group of people here. Um, although people from these groups are often categorized together because of similarities in physical features and similarities and overlaps in cultural values and belief systems, they're actually quite different and diverse in languages, customs, and migration experiences, um, essentially saying that we are not all the same here. AANHPI cultural values and living experiences largely continue to be understudied, under-researched in an empirical sense. The information that's out there, the research that's out there, um, explores immigrant experiences which date back to the 1800s and oftentimes will highlight uh, uh, events of racism, oppression, segregation, including but certainly not limited to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, as well as Executive Order 9066 um, of World War II, which resulted in the internment of um, Japanese Americans. These events have contributed and perpetuate modern day, quote unquote, other and 
quote unquote, foreigner labels um, and stereotypes, which still hold true for many today. In recent years though, due to social media and the speed in which information is accessed and shared, uh, global events such as COVID-19 and recent waves of anti-Asian sentiment, um, there's been more attention in campaigns to raise awareness of AANHPI uh, concerns. The word representation, quote unquote, has gained momentum and has contributed to increased visibility of AANHPI in positions of leadership, arts and entertainment, and advocacy. AAPI Heritage Month was signed into law in 1991 by President George H.W. Bush and is now celebrated every May. We're gonna talk about the role in uh, Asian cultural values and expectations play into mental health issues. Uh, Asian cultural values and expectations are largely what influences relationships, behaviors, personality, customs, communication patterns, and an overall general sense of well-being. Historically, these values can um, be sort of summarized by uh, uh, these five points here. The first one being collectivism. So in general, thinking as a part of a larger group, okay? Thinking as a larger group, not individually. The second one is internalization of emotions. So essentially keeping our emotions inside, not verbally expressing them keeping them uh, to ourselves and not sharing them, especially negative emotions. The third one being filial piety, which is essentially uh, one sense of duty and loyalty to family. The fourth one being social conformity and harmony. So uh, learning to live um, within your community, avoiding conflict, maintaining peace. And then the fifth one, which is a huge one, is um, the concept of saving face, quote unquote face which essentially means not causing shame or embarrassment to your family. Cultural pressures and expectations by family of origin to succeed and accomplish at a high level. Um, we're talking academically, professionally, and financially. Uh, AA and HPI are also expected to uh, get married, have children, preferably males, uh, take care of aging parents and gain social status through material wealth. Now, I do recognize that a lot of these are um, pressures and expectations that um, a lot of people experience. Um, not going to say that every single family expects these things, but we do see um, enough of uh, the expectations kind of carry through generation after generation, and um, it is very prevalent in many families to this day. The process of acculturation, which is um, learning to assimilate into a new culture, can also affect mental health. People of the 1.5 and second generation face bicultural challenges of wanting to feel American, to, feel in, to, to fit in with their peers at school and in the workplace, and at the same time, trying to hold on to their Asian values. Navigating between two distinct cultures um, is, a, is a really tough thing to do for a lot of people and oftentimes causes a lot of stress and anxiety. Decision-making. Uh, this is a big one. Decision making is not made in an individual sense. Oftentimes people feel that they need to make decisions thinking about um, family and what makes the family proud. There's often a script of a certain way to do things that many Asians feel they must follow in order to be successful and maintain face for, for their families. Okay, so we're going to talk about how mental health is a taboo in the AANHPI communities. Meeting Asian values and expectations can often come at a great cost to one's mental health. Uh, prioritizing one's mental health is often minimized and oftentimes sacrificed for the sake of following cultural norms, family expectations, and maintaining harmony. Productivity, um, being productive in life, is a strong virtue and supersedes the need for self-care, emotional wellness, and overall mental health. There is a very high value placed on stoicism, which is essentially the ability to endure hardship or distress without complaining. Um, feelings of distress are not to be displayed outwardly. And children learn pretty early on to internalize, uh, to suppress and to push down any negative feelings. And even overly positive feelings are not encouraged and oftentimes minimized for the sake of appearing in control and not appearing quote unquote too emotional. And so as such, there's a strong stigma that persists. Um, admitting that you have a mental health struggle is a taboo. And it's seen as being weak, causing your family uh, shame and embarrassment. So suffering in silence and the refusal to acknowledge mental health issues then becomes um, the norm, okay? 
We're gonna spend some time talking about um, the model minority myth and how it harms and perpetuates stereotypes, stigma, and shame. So we see the word smart, hardworking, good workers, doesn't complain, quiet, reliable. There's many more, but these are some words that I kind of came up with. And these are words that oftentimes will represent stereotypes for people that are born of um, model minority. And it's a term that essentially has been used um, to refer to minority groups that have uh, been able to achieve success, having a, achieved the American dream, quote unquote. Um, despite struggles, especially in a manner that contrasts with other minority groups. Um, this is something that perpetuates um, the stereotypes that um, Asians are often, uh, as a group, monolithic, uh, sort of one-dimensional, and all having the same shared experiences. And despite its positive overtones, uh, the term is actually damaging for AANHPI as well as other people of color. Um, essentially, one of the unfortunate byproducts is that the model minority myth pits people of color against each other and ignores the ultimate reality, which is that systemic racism and oppressive structures um, are actually what contribute to, to, to some of these um, difficulties and that people continue to encounter these in life. Uh, the assumption that all AA and HPI are successful, they don't struggle, and that they've made it uh, is a myth. One measure that challenges this myth is for example, income equality, or excuse me, income inequality, which is a measure of the economic gap between the rich and the poor within the AANHPI communities. Um, from 1970 through 2016, the gap in the standard of living between Asians at the very top and at the very bottom of the income ladder um, nearly doubled. We have the widest gap, we have the widest uh, income gap of any group um, living in the US. And other ways that um, model minority myth um, harms mental health. Um, it perpetuates the stigma because it's resulted in many um, ethnic minority individuals within the US internalizing the stereotypes that it actually promotes, including people within the um, AA and HPI communities. It prevents people from seeking the mental health support that they need. And so essentially what we see is we have a self-fulfilling prophecy starting to form, um, which instills a mindset of self-stigmatization. Self For example, I see all my Asian friends doing well and not struggling, so something must be wrong with me. When in actuality, many AA and HPI do struggle emotionally, but have just learned to hide their struggles, okay? So this is all buying into the whole sense of not sharing about one's feelings and just kind of keeping things suppressed. And so many people without even realizing have bought into the myth that there's only one way to define success and that they have to be hardworking, academically gifted, and ultimately successful in their careers and economic goals. And this is a myth that just keeps perpetuating generation after generation. And so we've learned to buy into it. Um, when people are not able to live up to the standards held by the model minority, uh, feelings of shame and despair are often internalized, which then perpetuate the stigma. So you start to see that we have this cycle. And so um, it just perpetuates and continues and continues, okay? Okay, so uh, let's see. Common stressors contributing to mental health issues. So in addition to the model minority myth, other stressors that affect mental health. And this is something that I compiled a list based on reasons why people come to me as a counselor seeking therapy. But I also had a chance to sort of informally um, uh, check in with other colleagues in the field, other Asian American um, colleagues who provide um, mental health counseling, just to kind of get a sense of when, um, AA and HPI folks um, seek out counseling, what are the reasons that they present with in terms of why they're seeking mental health treatment? And so um, there's a, a list that we compiled here and in no particular order, but these are just um, the most prevalent uh, reasons for um, why people seek out treatment. Um, number one being the lack of agency or autonomy. So the frustration of having to do what's expected by my family, feelings of guilt around wanting to think and act individually but not being able to because of cultural norms and expectations. For example, I am actually really creative and love to draw, but I'm not allowed to study art because my family expects me to study to be a doctor. Or I feel like I can't be myself. I have to do, or I have to be what my family expects. So those, um, those kinds of feelings can contribute to a, a lot of distress and, and anxiety. 
Um, this one, I kind of, I coined the term check off the box syndrome. I don't really know if it really exists, but this is just what I came up with. Um, and this is essentially, I've done everything I was supposed to do. I checked off all the boxes of what I'm supposed to do, but I feel restless, stuck, and or unfulfilled. And unfortunately, I feel these things, but I'm not able to share these with my family because I've been taught to suppress my feelings, okay? Um, the next one is, you think you have it bad? So the sense of feeling minimized or dismissed by family of origin because previous generations suffered far worse circumstances or trauma. So it's shameful for children or young adults to share their struggles knowing that others before them survived so much worse. So for example, second generation where they were born here in the States um, didn't have the um, struggles and challenges that came with the immigration process. And so they're in a much um, more fortunate position in the sense that there wasn't the immigration struggles, um, perhaps they're already born into families that um, have achieved some uh, material wealth. And so um, there's not the, uh, the sense of having to struggle financially, but yet there's all these pressures that are placed upon them, okay? So um, when people present with these feelings, oftentimes they're met with, um, you think you have it so bad, you know, uh, you don't, your, your situation is um, not anything like what your family has experienced. And so um, it, it's silly for you to think that you have, uh, you know, mental health distress. Um, another one is just the, the uh, uh, LGBTQ um, plus identity. So people that um, identify as such um, oftentimes experience distress related to families not accepting their identity and lifestyle. And so there's a lot of internalization of, of shame that comes with that. And we're gonna continue on. I'm having the same issue again with not being able to page down. Let me go back to this and come back. Okay, so more uh, stressors that contribute to mental health. Um, loneliness, making friends, navigating friendships is very prevalent in adolescents and young adults. Um, this is a huge stressor that um, oftentimes is, is why people seek out counseling. Um, many young people, may, many uh, young AAPI uh, people did not grow up having role models for how to handle interpersonal conflict because um, peace and harmony is such a strong uh, value that um, they're oftentimes not witnessed towards uh, how, how to see people handle conflict. And so when they're dealing with conflict in their own friendships or uh, relationships, um, they oftentimes will lack the skills to resolve these conflicts. And this can cause a lot of emotional distress. The scarcity mindset. And this is the notion that everyone lives in competition with everyone else and that there's a finite amount of resources to go around. Um, and what this looks like is there's a sense, um, an automatic feeling of never having enough, always assuming the worst is going to happen and that whatever you do, it's never enough. So what this looks like um, is oftentimes people presenting with low self-esteem, low self-worth, um, a lack of confidence, um, making safe decisions for fear and having the fear of failure. So this is a thought process that is rooted in anxiety and basic survival. And it's very, very prevalent in the early days following immigration, but never fully goes away. And um, this is something that um, is prevalent in, in, in um, a lot of AANHPI culture um, without even realizing that oftentimes um, when people uh, will seek out a promotion, sometimes their family members are like, why do you wanna do that? You have a good job already. So oftentimes it can feel like um, parents are not encouraging, you know, children to, to, to go for a promotion. You already have a good job, you get paid well, you know, why do you wanna do that? Um, or the idea of going back to school, you know, why would you wanna do that? You already have a good job, you know, um, you, you know you're already educated, you don't need more education. Um, so there's a sense of feeling um, like uh, the fear of failure or the, um, the worry that, um, trying out for something new is going to um, set them back. So that's the scarcity mindset. And then the next one is imposter syndrome. And this is the feeling of doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud, even despite 
your high, high level of education, the experiences that you've had and the accomplishments that you have. Um, this is a very common uh, issue that I come across a lot um, working with my clients, particularly um, uh, people in technology. Um, and I see it quite often with, um, with young female professionals working in technology. Um, there's that feeling of, I'm not sure if I really belong here. You know, how did I end up working you know, for Google when um, I feel like I shouldn't be here? Um, and then the last one is social comparison with peers at school or in the workplace, resulting in feelings of inadequacy or questioning one's choices. So the pressure to keep up, the fear of um, judgment and worrying about how one will measure up within a social group. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna talk about COVID and mental health. So um, the last couple of years of COVID um, have been really, really hard for AA and HPI um, mental health. The perception of COVID originating in China has been a very stressful, stressful one for Asian communities, um, which has resulted in xenophobia and bigotry. Um, we've had a lot of reported incidents, um, reported incidents ranging from uh, verbal harassment, insults and jokes, and such as referring to COVID-19 as the Kung flu, uh, to violent attacks in schools, businesses, and other public spaces. And this has resulted in increases in anxiety, depression, uh, sleep problems, and a general sense of not feeling safe. And in response to the Atlanta shootings in March of 2021, um, we started to see um, a lot of social justice and grassroots AA and HPI groups um, uh, join together to, to organize to encourage um, Asian uh, um, people to challenge the stigma against mental health care. Okay, webinars, social media, um, workshops, educational campaigns, and mental health resources have all been provided to the communities. There's been a real uptick in people wanting to reach out um, for services, um, you know, calling out um, the stigma and um, movement in, in, in a good direction towards trying to bring this out in the open that um, mental health care is actually a good thing. Uh, many people are challenging the cultural norms that have kept Asians silent for many, many generations and younger people are starting to educate the older generation. Um, and basically educating them that suffering and silence has actually been very, very damaging for our population. We're gonna talk about how do we ultimately work towards destigmatizing um, AA and HPI mental health. And so the hardest thing is um, just recognizing that you know, through um, generations and generations of thinking a certain way, it really requires ultimately a shift in the way we think about things. So we really have to work on adjusting how we think about mental health. Decide that it is a source of strength to talk about feelings, not a weakness, but a strength, especially talking about unpleasant feelings. Decide that it's part of, it's part of the human condition. There's absolutely no shame in it. And the more we talk about it, the more it gets normalized. So you can start with, I didn't have a great day today. I'm worried I didn't do well on my test. I don't feel that great about my career and would like to explore my options. Just bringing these thoughts out in the open is the first step, okay? Acknowledging it out loud. And then we wanna move towards talking about it with your family, with your friends and your peers about mental health. Learn to be okay with sharing your emotional struggles with other people. Talk about the choices you can make to improve your own mental health. Even if others don't approve or feel uncomfortable initially, recognize that this is a function of the taboo that has persisted, okay? Change needs to start somewhere. Openly talk about seeking mental health treatment. Seeking counseling is perfectly okay, even when there is not a crisis. Treat it the same way you would as if you were to seek treatment for a medical condition like diabetes or cancer. Look at counseling the same way you would look at yoga, meditation, exercise, or other self-care practices, okay? Other ways we can destigmatize um, mental health. Let's show compassion and empathy for those who do struggle with mental health issues. Respond with emotionally supportive words and gestures. Do this in the presence of others, okay? And once we start doing that and um, normalizing that practice, um, we start to see that it's actually a good thing and people will respond in kind. Call out language that perpetuates mental health stigma. Try to avoid self-stigmatization self and embrace empowerment over shame. 
help to shift the narrative in your family of origin. This is not an easy thing to do because um, the way people think about it is very much baked in our in, in, in culture and through generations. Um, but we are starting to see a, a slight shift. And so um, that can be helpful when we are able to help build the momentum with that. Read books, watch movies, TV programs that openly discuss mental health issues in Asian communities. Discuss these with your family and friends. Normalize the talk. Look for positive role models in the AANHPI community who are open about their own mental health struggles. And some examples include US figure skater, Vincent Joe, uh, tennis player, Naomi Osaka, and Surgeon General Vivek Murthy. All of them have been very open about their mental health struggles and um, are hoping to kind of uh, to spread the word that it's actually okay to talk about these struggles and that there's no shame in seeking support. And, um, and I put this at the end, all of this is way easier said than done, but we need to start somewhere, okay? It starts, starts with you. Okay, so when it gets to the point that you're looking for a mental health provider, or you're trying to help a family member seek out a provider, um, look for, do your best to do some research. Um, try to research providers and look for ideally people that are um, culturally competent. Um, these are people that have proper training or lived experiences that can relate to uh, some of the issues or this, the distress that you're feeling. If you need to find someone that is fluent in your relevant language, um, you know, there's certain uh, agencies and resources out there that can provide that. Most therapists will provide a 20 minute free consultation. So talk to a few of them if it's possible to get a feel for different styles and approaches. Ask a provider if they have experience treating AANHPI issues, um, if they have any specialized training in how to treat this population, learn about their approach and different modalities of treatment. Um, and learn about how, um, ask if they know that uh, if their uh, knowledge of cultural backgrounds can influence communication about how they, they provide treatment and consider how aspects of cultural identity may affect um, their approach to treatment, okay? And uh, I think my last slide is going to be talking about the future of AANHPI mental health. So um, AANHPI is the fastest growing demographic in the US currently comprising about 7% of the population. And, and that number is just gonna keep growing. Um, I don't have any, uh, stats in front of me in terms of where we're going to be say in five or ten years but the number is continually growing at a pretty high trajectory and right now um although uh, uh asians in a general sense still don't um, seek mental health treatment at the same rate as other groups in the u.s um, we are starting to see some shifts and um, studies have shown that second generation immigrants are more likely than their parents to seek mental health care um, there's been a lot of public information campaigns and engagement efforts to increase awareness of mental health issues. Um, and we're encouraging people of all backgrounds to speak up and ask for help. Um, younger generation AA and HPI are starting to shift the narrative um, to reduce the stigma and sending messages that reaching out for mental health treatment is not only okay, but necessary to help cope with mental health stress and dealing with the events of the world. And as more and more AA and HPI seek out mental health treatment, it is increasingly evident that we have a huge supply and demand issue. Um, there's a huge shortage of culturally competent providers right now. Um, we definitely need more providers um, to accommodate the increase in clients reaching out. And if you are a student or if you have um, children who are um, students in high school thinking about um, going to college in the next few years, um, consider the field of behavioral sciences, psychology, sociology, social work as a field of study to ultimately meet the demand. Um, we need more and more people out there and I am happy to talk to anybody that's interested in this field. Um, you can make a very, very viable living doing this kind of work. It's very gratifying. Um, there's a real need out there. And um, yeah, I think uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody, but it's, uh, we definitely need more folks doing this kind of work. And then um, the last couple pages here, I just have um, a list of some resources that um, I hope you guys can um, find useful. Uh, we have the Asian American Psychological Association, the Asian Mental Health Collective. Um, and this is a really great resource right here, um, Asian Mental Health Collective. Um, you can look up their website. They also have an Instagram page and they just provide a lot of great stuff out there. Uh, the National Asian American Pacific Islander Mental Health Association, the National Alliance for Mental Health, or Mental Illness, excuse me. 
and they have a, a section within their um, website that's devoted towards um, AAPI uh, mental health. Asian American Health Initiative, and Very Well Mind is a general uh, health website, um, but they had a great page for um, uh, AAPI resources that were sort of compiled where they took um, everything that's out there and sort of put it in one place. And then the last one I offer, because um, for those people that are seeking counseling or interested in seeking counseling, this is a great resource, um, multiculturalcounselors.org. It's a Seattle area directory of AANHPI and POC mental health providers, okay? And then the next page is just um, for those of you that are active on social media, Instagram, um, these are people that have, um, that I believe are providers that actually have mental health pages and they provide resources that are uh, relevant towards mental health. Okay. And thank you for being here tonight. Here's my information, my contact info. And then uh, I wanna thank again, City of Shoreline and Shoreline PTA Mental Health uh, Committee for inviting me here. Um, we would love for some feedback on tonight's presentation. Uh, if there's more you would like to see or have questions, again, feel free to contact me. Um, but if you can take a few minutes to fill out this, uh, this survey, uh, your feedback would be really appreciated. Okay, that's it for me. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there's anybody that uh, has questions in the chat box. Thanks, Lynette. Um, I did drop that link to the survey in the chat too. Um, so please take a moment to um, complete that. Um, and just one point of clarification, I misspoke earlier when I was talking about the um, caregiver connections group that we're going to start and we're gonna kick off. I um, wanna clarify that that's for um, Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander caregivers. It's not open to the public and to anybody. So I apologize for misspeaking. Um, and more information about that can be found on our website as well. Um, so let's see, I'm looking in the chat and there's been a lot of um, great discussion about um, perceptions of um, mental health. And um, as you mentioned earlier, Lynette, about mistrust of Western medicine. Um, so that's kind of come up um, a few times around that. Um, and I did so, one um, question in the Q&A. Uh, thank you, Cherry. It says, Aloha, Lynette. Thank you for your wisdom. Is there a propensity for AAPI to dismiss domestic violence and to get necessary help? I'm not sure if I understand your question, uh, Cherry, but are you kind of asking more about um, how, how DV is um, handled in API communities? And Cherry, I unmuted you. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, please. I was wondering if there is more of a propensity to accept domestic violence and to not get the necessary help for for that, and how to navigate uh, getting those uh, that need the help uh, to break those stigmas that are there. Thank you. So Sherry, I, I will say that uh, DV is not my strongest suit, but um, having worked in community mental health for uh, almost 17 years, um, it, it, does, uh, it does happen in the AAPI communities. Um, and the same way there's stigma for mental health, there's a lot of people that don't speak up for fear of um, retribution, uh, fear of not being believed. Um, so a lot of the things that hold true for other populations also hold true for um, uh, AAPI, and oftentimes because um, even families of origin are not necessarily willing to believe these kinds of things. But there are resources out there for people that do want to try to um, address them and, and, and to kind of get themselves out of their unsafe situations. And um, what I can do is I don't have any uh, handy, but if you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to um, look up some resources for you. And I, I 
I still have some colleagues out in the field that do this kind of work, so I can kind of check to see what's available for you. Thanks for that question, Sherry. Um, <clears throat> the next question we have, Lynette, is um, from the Lou's, and I don't know if there are any of my relatives or not, but um, <laughs> it's a common name. Um, as mentioned, second and third generation Asians tend to be more open to seeking treatment or support of um, or supportive of those seeking treatment. So how can we convince the older generation, like our parents, that treatment can be effective and not a sign of weakness? You know, that's just one of those things that just starts with the conversation a little bit at a time. You know, the 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 points that I gave on how to destigmatize um, stigma, um, none of those things will happen overnight. So it's about um, changing the framework and how we think about it. Um, and so with older adults, um, it's not impossible. It, it, it's, it's definitely, you know, um, more challenging. There's no question about it because I think when we have people that are at an age of, you know, elderly, like 60, 70 years old, I mean, they're already set in their ways. And so there's, there's less likeliness that they want to do things differently when they've done things a certain way. So they've learned to adapt over time to whatever it is that they're dealing with. And so oftentimes, you know, younger generation, adult children, um, who have had experiences with mental health treatment can see the value of it. And so trying to have these conversations um, can be challenging. It's not impossible. Um, sometimes what can be helpful sometimes is uh, engaging in the, the, the treatment together. So perhaps trying to talk, you know, a grandmother or a, a mom, an older mom or dad um, into maybe um, coming with them to, to talk to the therapist, maybe just for like 15 minutes, just start with something small, you know. And so that can be a starting point, um, but it is challenging. And I, I, I recognize that there's a reason why the younger generation is more likely to open up than the older generation, because the older generation, this is, um, this is a paradigm that has been existed in, in the culture for, for generations and, and, and centuries, quite honestly. And so it's, it's only the probably 1.5 to second generation that we're starting to think a little differently. Um, yeah. So it, it takes time. None of those things are going to happen overnight, but it's 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 moving the needle in a different direction is what I see it. And um, I see another question in the chat here from Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. Thanks for coming. Um, can you touch on the generational trauma? in the AA and HPI community, and maybe advice for healing when older generations don't wanna talk about it. Yeah, that's a tough one because, uh, you know, when somebody has had really traumatic experiences in their childhood or upbringing, um, and certainly part of the immigration process, um, those are experiences that stay with them for, for forever, for a long time. And so, um, Again, this you know kind of goes back to shifting the framework and the paradigm. And so there's a sense that talking about it is just going to make them relive their trauma experiences more. And what I try to do with um, working with older, because I actually have worked with um, uh, older adults as well, and um, helping them see differently that holding on to trauma and painful experiences actually makes them feel worse. It lives inside the body, and when it doesn't um, get talked about and get expressed, it stays inside the body and it manifests into other health issues. So if you have um, issues like insomnia or gastrointestinal issues, chronic headaches, a lot of that sometimes when they've gone to doctors where they're not getting any kind of um, you know, definitive results about what's the source of you know, these headaches or the stomach issues, um, oftentimes it's, it's the, the trauma that lives within the body. So, um, Helping them see that, you know what, um, maybe it's not so much talking about feelings, but maybe um, talking about trauma or seeking out treatment can help you sleep better at night. Um, sometimes it can help you have less stomach issues. So I think sometimes if we're able to tie it towards um, an aspect of where they actually physically feel better, they might be more willing to seek out the services as opposed to thinking about how they feel. Feelings and thoughts, those are kinds of um, a little bit more of a foreign concept. I think um, older generation tends to be a little bit more um, wanting something practical, something tangible. So uh, if it means they can sleep a little bit better, 
if it means um, they don't have as much of an upset stomach all the time, um, if it means that their headaches, you know, aren't as um, severe, um, that may be the value that they're looking for in terms of recognizing that there could be some, some good in going to treatment. Okay, thank you for the question. It's a good question. We have another one that came up here from the Luz. Um, you mentioned reading books, watching movies, or TV series that might exhibit positive examples of Asians talking about mental health and a challenge as a way to break the stigma. So do you have some examples of books or movies that you recommend? Yeah, you know, um, I, I'm going to put together a list because I see actually this could be a really helpful thing, but um, I've been reading some of the books that my daughter's been reading in her... <laughs> Just because um, a lot of them are young adult books. And there's one that I read not too long ago called, um, oh my goodness, I think I have it. The Astonish, uh, I actually have it on my bookshelf here. Just one second, I'm going to reach for this one. Okay, here's one that's really great. I don't know if you guys can see, it's called The Astonishing Color of after. And it's a young adult book, and it's written by a uh, young author named Emily XR Pan, P-A-N. And um, it basically talks about um, her mom having uh, committed suicide and what she's been having to deal with, you know, addressing that issue. And um, I just found it to be a lovely read um, in the sense that it was very visual and um, very emotional. And I, but I thought it was a really good way for, um, for her how to express and how she coped with it. And so there's that one. And then there's a lot of um, just, you know, young adult uh, books for um, the AAPI community. Uh, there's one that right now that I'm reading called, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, the Summer of a Thousand Pies. That's written by Margaret Dilloway. She's a Japanese American author. And she writes about a young uh, gal coming of age that um, is navigating going through the foster care system and having to uh, you know, bounce around to different places. And so I found that to be a really good read, but I will compile those because I actually find that there's a lot of good ones out there. And so um, I think it'd be really helpful to, because I think we can kind of get a sense of how people relate um, and how it's addressed and just the experiences that people have. It's very robust and yeah. And in terms of TV shows, um, let's see. Um, I have to kind of go back and look at um, stuff that I've watched over the last uh, few months. I, I know I've definitely have. Um, oh, I love Turning Red. Turning Red was a great one. Did you guys see? That's a Pixar one that just came <laughs> came out not too long ago. Um, and that one I really enjoy just because anything that normalizes um, just real life experiences that um, should be brought out to the open. Um, anything we, anytime we normalize just normal coming of age experiences is a good thing. There should be no shame in talking about puberty or menstruation and things like that. Okay. So that was actually a really good way to sort of depict um, coming of age in a positive way. Okay. And um, Crazy Rich Asians, which I loved a few years ago, that was a fun movie and and more for um, just the, the, the lighthearted, but I think it really helped to um, sort of send the message that, you know, um, you know, Asian Americans can have, or, you know, Asians of different cultures can have just normal experiences that everybody deals with, right? That you didn't necessarily have to be Asian to, 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 to fit into any of those um, roles in that movie, okay? So that's a great one. And um, yeah, just lots, I mean, we're starting to see a lot more um, that are coming out, which is, which is great. And so we're, you know, like I said, the word representation is starting to um, pick up momentum and, uh, and just seeing Asian Americans in roles that we typically don't see them in. Um, yeah, thank you. Another one that's mentioned here is The Farewell. Is the Farewell, one. yes, that's an excellent one. And, and more recently, you know, literally just in the last few days, um, over the weekend, I caught the Stars on Ice show that came through uh, uh, Climate Pledge and basically showed all the Olympic uh, figure skaters. And I've been really captivated by Vincent Joe. Um, he was the uh, uh, Chinese American skater that had to withdraw because of COVID at the last minute and mm -hmm. just a devastating experience for, for this young man. And he worked so hard, you know, training all his life. And he has been so open about his mental health struggles 
And I just really have appreciated just the openness and the vulnerability that he shared. And I actually think this is going to be part of his legacy, you know, and really trying to normalize just the conversations and being so open about it. And he's a child of, you know, two um, Chinese immigrants. And I can imagine how hard it was, you know, trying to meet the cultural expectations of his family, having to do everything at a really high level and, um, and just being really, really open about his experiences. Same with um, Naomi Osaka talking about uh, her struggles as well. Um, and I mentioned um, Vivek Murthy, he's our Surgeon General, and he's been very, very open about just his experiences dealing with loneliness and how we all need to reach out and, and offer support to each other. And there's no shame in that. So, so I appreciate any time um, we're able to, to uh, work against the stereotypes of our culture that, um, that do us harm and actually uh, just basically put that, you know, put out there that we're just everyday normal people, three-dimensional people that have, you know, everyday issues that everybody else has. Yeah, another great example of that is Kim's Convenience too. It's a... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but that'd be great if you could put together a list because I think I that's will. helpful and it could help, you know, sitting around watching it with uh, uh, older or younger could really spur on conversations. I do see another um, question here in the chat by uh, Rebecca. Thanks for your question. It says, um, my child experienced Asian microaggression from her table partner at school after a physical aggression mm. with the boy writing on her, on her jacket in hand. How do you address the aftermath of this kind of a situation? How old is the child? Let's say, um, not sure if Rebecca, you wanna type in the chat an age and if you don't want to, oh, 13 year old. 13 year old. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing to do is just to, uh, validate you know i can't express enough about validation uh, we have the tendency as parents and understandably so i have a 14 year old we want to make their pain go away as quickly as possible and uh you know help them heal as quickly as possible but we cannot do that until we validate and so what i mean by validating is just giving the child the space to be able to share whatever frustrations he or she feels he or she they feel okay it's really important to just acknowledge that that must have been so frustrating and hurtful for you you know, what do you need from me? Okay. Um, how can I be of help? And sometimes they may not necessarily want um, the problem fixed per se, um, which is really hard for us parents sometimes because we want to fix it. And, and, and sometimes we internalize what our child experienced. You know, it may conjure up feelings from our childhood that um, sometimes we don't even realize that we're actually living our child's experience through what we experienced. And, and that is something to kind of keep in mind because oftentimes, um, your experience is probably going to be different than your child's experience, um, but it is uh, it is worthwhile to make the space for for your child to be able to share. Um, and when when if a child comes to you and they're really in a heated moment and they're really just expressing a lot of pain, um, at that moment I find it most helpful just to sit and validate um, and try not to move into problem solving right away because when we're in an escalated state is oftentimes when we tend to. Uh, be very heightened in our responses. And so we're not always thinking um, in a rational sense in terms of how to problem solve, okay? When the feelings settle down, then we can kind of, you know, think a little bit more rationally and logically about, okay, what would we like, what do we want to do with the situation? What can we do with it? How can I empower you to, but that's really hard. I understand that, you know, parents feel deeply what their, their children go through, particularly if there's a, um, a sense of, uh, you know, injustice or, or, um, a microaggression. Thank you. Good luck with it. Yeah, thanks, Lynette. Um, we're almost out of time here. Um, I think we might have time for one more question. Um, sorry, Rebecca, were you going to say something? I saw that you unmuted and then removed. My apologies. Yeah, I just Because sometimes you're not sure if you did the right thing as a parent. Um, and we try to resolve what in a restorative way, but um, there was just lack of time and too much time went by. And my daughter said she didn't want to um, go through with the restorative process because um, she's like, they'll just re trigger everything. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I would probably also just thank her for being open and, and feeling comfortable being able to share that, you know, because that's that's half the battle right there. Right? I mean, think about how far that is compared to previous generations and never even talking about it. Right. 
So just the mere fact that your child is able to come to you and share that is already, uh, you know, a win right there. Yeah, just want to clarify that she didn't come. Oh, um, us. it had to be um, pulled out of her. Um, I see. School and something just didn't seem right. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's hard, you know, because we know they're not well and, you know, we want the information so we can help, you know, address whatever's going on. Um, but I think what you could do is probably just, you know, help her see that ultimately, I hope we can see that talking about it hopefully helps to um, start the healing process. Um, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. We encourage her to talk to her friends. And, um, yeah. She's not in it alone. Well, and something to think about as parents, if a lot of the people here tonight are parents, is um, think about how you show up in your own relationships with people in your lives, you know, in your, in, you know, your marriage um, to your children's spouse or um, your friendships or those kinds of, because your kids are watching, you know, so I often find that um, how we behave and how we, you know, show up in relationships, um, it's important to model, I think. And, and show um, show our kids, you know, what it looks like when we're having um, thoughtful discussion, you know, even if we're having a conflict with, you know, our spouse, um, I don't necessarily think that's always a bad thing. You know, I think it's good for kids to see that we can disagree with people and then ultimately be respectful and still repair the relationship or come to some sort of agreement. Those kinds of things can be helpful too. Lynette, you're wonderful. Those are such good points. And thank you for taking time to answer the questions. Um, I think it's been really helpful. And um, if you'd like to continue the discussion um, in a smaller group setting, um, again, that first talk will be next Thursday. Um, and uh, the information is on our website, um, shorelinepta.org, uh, the Mental Health Committee. Um, so thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Um, and um, let's get on to breaking the stigma and, and healing our communities. So thank you all. Appreciate it. Um, Missy, before we actually sign off for the evening, I did pose a question earlier in chat. Oh, sorry. Um, before we let Lynette go. Um, what I said is that I really appreciated your encouragement, Lynette, of of our high school students to pursue the behavioral sciences as a future career path. So um, could you share with us, like for those that are currently in high school, what kind of courses should they be taking um, today in preparation for, for the future journey? And then what does the post-secondary um, educational journey look like? Because I've always heard it takes a lot, you know, quite a bit of time. Um, and um, any other related experiences um, as a future therapist or psychologist? Well, sure. Um, certainly in high school, I believe um, they offer psychology. So I recommend taking psychology. Um, that's how I got my first taste of the behavioral sciences. And this is in high school. And I ate it up. <laughs> it's, uh, I just loved it. And so, um, so I started studying it in uh, college. And I didn't declare a major right away. But I think by the end of the first year, I declared my major. And, and I will say that initially I started off, you know, moving more towards research, but then eventually made my way over to, to counseling. And so um, that's where I am now. And so it does, uh, for people that actually want to eventually become counselors, you know, you, you need a, a four-year degree in some sort of behavioral science. And so that's usually psychology, uh, sociology, um, social work. You can also do biology. You can even do other fields and disciplines. Um, and then ultimately you do need to have a, a master's to be able to practice. And so there's different kinds of counseling or psychology disciplines, counseling, clinical psychology, uh, you know, to actually do practice in terms of mental health, we're looking at um, probably counseling or social work or uh, clinical psychology. And um, you can practice with a master's. So that's usually two years of um, post-college plus an internship. Um, there are people that go on for doctorates and those oftentimes tend to be people that wanna go into research or academia, but there are people that also do that kind of work but maybe have a small practice off to the side. Um, so, but again, happy to talk to anybody that wants to consider this field. I do plan on hopefully in the fall, um, I, I reached out to Shorecrest last year and I spoke with their AAPI club and I'm gonna hopefully do that again this fall as well as um, Shorewood to talk with um, both AAPI clubs just to kind of, 
um, reach out and, and let them know that this is a field that we really need people to come into this field. Okay, we really do because um, if the trajectory continues and more and more people are reaching out for mental health services, um, the reality is that uh, we get the best outcomes when people are working with people that can relate to their experiences. So um, not to say that if an AA and HPI person works with somebody that's not AA and HPI, um, they can still have good outcomes, but I find um, we really can get great outcomes when we're able to work with someone that can really understand the backstory, understand the cultural expectations, um, the family values, all of that stuff. Um, sometimes um, people that don't have that kind of upbringing just are not able to fully understand some of those experiences. Um, sometimes it helps to relate to somebody that has, um, you know, parents as immigrants, you know, because there's a whole backstory that comes with that as well, you know. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a little bit about uh, studying to become a counselor. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynette, for, for addressing that and uh, look forward to connecting you with our high schools again. So yeah. I'll be in touch with that. Okay, Missy, we'll let you close. <laughs> Thank you again. Thanks, Lynette. Appreciate it. And thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Take care, everybody. I'm just staying on so that I can make sure I grab everything because <laughs> I, I get afraid. Oh, I'll, I'll stop our recording. <laughs>